the NBA Summer League has been in action for a few days. There's been three leagues in play. Who's impressed us already and changed our opinions? Find out next. Welcome into NBA Locked On NBA Big Board. I'm Leif Tuline, and I'm joined alongside by Sam Ferris. Sam's been watching in person. I unfortunately have not been. I've been watching closely from home, but I wanted to turn it over to you, Sam, as you've been able to take the closer look, especially about yesterday, where we saw some of the biggest names in the draft process battle it out against one another. Who has impressed you thus far? Yeah, I've, I've been on the road trying to hit the summer leagues as much as possible. Unfortunately, couldn't make it all the way over to California for the California Classic, but uh, I've been in person at the Salt Lake Summer League and then was in person last night at the two games in Vegas. So I think we've both seen them. You can kind of give your perspective as we go through from afar. And luckily, I've been able to see them in person. Um, we can talk a little about the Utah Summer League probably today as well. But yeah, I think we can start with Vegas since that is the most recent and two big games yesterday, starting with Jabari Smith and Paolo. The main takeaway that, you know, for me being there in person was Paolo Boncaro. I thought he looked the part of the number one pick and seeing him in person, he just popped physically. Like, you know, he's big, but seeing him in person, he is just so physically put together. And so uh, being able to see him and Jabari Smith next to each other, you do see Jabari Smith might be, you know, an inch or so bigger, but Paolo, it's easy to see why the magic may have fell in love with him, seeing him in person, um, watching him in person, because just physically, he's different from a lot of the guys out there. So put together for a guy that is six foot ten, and for me, Leaf, the thing that stood out to me in his game, and th this is no different from how we scouted him throughout the past season, was his passing, which was phenomenal. I thought that my main takeaway from that game was his passing. The rest of his offensive game, like I thought, Jabari Smith did a really, really nice job guarding him. And that was the most fun of, of game one was seeing them actually guard each other because a lot of times when we get that star matchup, they'll cross guard, they'll cross matchup onto someone else. But these guys guarded each other and so that was a lot of fun. Jabari Smith did very well guarding him one-on-one, -on -one, but Paolo's passing to me was probably the one aspect of the game that was most impressive. And that was no surprising because to me that was probably the best aspect of his game as a prospect was the passing and ball handling at six foot 10. Yeah. Before we get too far, we'll, we'll touch on this game. And then in the next segment, we'll talk about Jaden Ivy, Jalen Duran, two guys that I know you're really high on and finalize in the Salt Lake summer league. But back to this story, the individual matchup between the number one and three pick that obviously is going to take the headlines and it should but another player that surprised me a little bit with, was Caleb Houston. And so we'll, we'll, let's touch on him a little bit, but Paolo, I think what impressed me is the fact that his three point shooting was considered to be a, a question mark coming to the draft for, for me, I felt pretty confident that his shooting would translate because he shot like 45% on catch and shoot threes, but he was able to shoot step back threes fadeaways from the mid post. And he did that with ease early in his very first NBA minutes um, in person the way he created space. I haven't seen Paolo in person. I've watched a ton of Duke games and, and obviously just watched the, the magic rocket summer league game. Does, does he create space by being physical or skilled or is it the combination of both as it appears? Um, mm -hmm. Because I think he's got just about as good as touch as anyone from like 10 feet and in, and then obviously yeah. shooting the ball, his arc and everything looks really good, which I thought was my biggest concern is that it was, his shot was a tad too flat at Duke. Yeah, it's interesting. What I'll add is um, my I went to the game with my dad and my brother. We got there early to see warmups. And it was funny because we were commenting that uh, Caleb Houston was making all of his warm-up threes and Paolo really wasn't. It was probably under like 50%. But then uh, when the game started, all the threes went in for Paolo. And my brother was like, yeah, he's a gamer. The, those weren't going in from that same spot in warm-ups. 
And when the game started, they were going in. So that was cool to see. Those are kind of the things you can pick up when you get there early and are able to watch warm-ups, which is kind of one of my favorite parts. And then, yeah, the space creation, uh, he, he was able to get to the step back. And because he's so big, but because also opponents really need to respect his downhill game, get into the basket, like you can't press up all the way into him like you can with Jabari Smith. Because Jabari just doesn't have that handle to break guys down and get by you right now. So guys can get up into his body, right? But with Paolo, you can't really press into him because his handle and strength is so good. He can just spin off of you and get into the paint and then either finish at the rim or kick it out. And so that's why he's a little bit more difficult to guard. And so you can't really press into him. And then when he gets to that step back, he's creating plenty of space to get the shot off. Now, the shot isn't going to go in. He's not going to shoot well over 40% from three, I don't think, as a rookie. But it, it looked really good. And the touch was nice because a few times it, he shot it and it hit the rim like once or twice. And we thought it wasn't going to go in and it, and it dropped in. He had at least one, maybe two and ones on deep jumpers where he got fouled. And so the touch was nice. And that space creation and just how you have to guard him is really important. Real quickly, before we move on to the, the nightcap of those games, was there any player that you thought that you were maybe not not right on or that have changed your perception on them from just that game between the Rockets and the Magic? No, the one guy that I've changed my opinion on a little bit is Jalen Williams, but that was in the Salt Lake Summer League. So last night, I wouldn't say there's anyone I really changed my opinion on, but one guy that I think... Uh, displayed a really important skill and it's something that we really thought about him as a prospect was josh christopher as a slasher uh he's just so physical when he gets a step and gets his shoulder downhill he's like impossible to deal with and i think a year or two from now when he solidifies himself in the rotation he's gonna be he could be and i think he will be one of the better slashers in the nba and then he's a creative finisher when he gets inside uh, the one aspect, though, from him is I think the coaches probably talked to him and wanted him to take initiative and to to get shots up because he wasn't really looking to pass. The Rockets weren't really getting Jabari Smith into spots to get him shots. So that was a little disappointing. And what I'll say on that is I love the Rockets young core, but what I do think they lack is passing. And the one guy that really facilitates that is Shen Goon, and he didn't play last night. And so I think they really need that infusion of creativity and passing from him. And, and so that's something that I think we'll need to see more of in the regular season, because outside of that, I love their young core, but they don't really have a lot of good passers. I think Tai Tai did play well last night. Um, but to get to your question, the one guy that I think really did impress me from that game in terms of one skill was Josh Christopher's slashing, getting downhill, finishing through contact, because being there in person, the game was very, very physical. A lot of athletes, guys haven't played in a while. They want to prove something. A lot of physical play, and Josh Christopher was able to play through that and be very effective slashing downhill. Yeah, I'm with you there. A really, really good athlete that I think is prime for a breakout. And we're going to talk about a few really good athletes that played in the next game, Jaden Ivey, Jalen Duran. But first, let me tell you about Truebill. Truebill is a new app that wants, wants to help you identify and stop paying for subscriptions that you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies just make subscriptions hard to cancel. You forget about them. They, they renew automatically. Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. Add, and your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. I, I need to use it. I've had a couple that I look at my bill and say, oh man, how in the world did I... How, do, how in the world have I been paying for this for three years? So starting Truebill has been a necessity. Don't fall for subscription, Sam's. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now to Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands a year. Welcome back into LockedOnNBA Big Board. I'm Leif Tulin, joined alongside by Sam Ferris. 
So we're both basketball junkies. The summer league, something that's fun for us and has been for years. Um, one thing I wanted to say about the summer league and especially as it pertains to last night and I'll, then I'll get to you cause you were there and you, you obviously were very high on Jalen Duran. And I think I'll partially, I'll give you some credit. It, it swayed my perception of Duran hearing you speak about him. And I moved him up later in my board. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing you look for isn't necessarily immediate success in the summer league. You look for traits translating early on. And what the dominant trait was for Jalen Duran was just the athleticism. And you've heard on the ESPN broadcast. I don't know if you heard this. They, uh, Doris Burke said that she heard uh, Jalen Duran was compared to Sean Kemp. That's something I've never thought of, but, and then he had an immediate three dunks in the first couple minutes. Um, just, just how imposing of an athlete was he? And then obviously Jaden Ivy as a, a different type of imposing athlete in person, how, how imposing were they? Yeah, two of my favorite prospects, and that's why I love the Pistons draft so much. Um, just watching him during warmups, and again, my dad was there with me. He, my dad follows the draft mostly, you know, because I and my brother do. He follows it not as closely as we do, obviously. But seeing Duran in person, my dad was like, "How did that guy fall to 13 with his, the frame that Duran has?" Seeing him in person, the dude is a man child going to be the youngest. He was the youngest prospect in the draft. He'll still be 18 when the season starts. And uh, I saw one of the media members, I can't remember who it was, but was sitting next to Tyron Liu. And uh, on either Duran's second or third dunk in the first few minutes when he rattled the rim, uh, Tyron Liu apparently was like, watch out, that dude is going to bring down the backboard on on one of these dunks. And uh, my kind of nickname for Jalen Duran is catch radius because anything around the rim he catches and finishes with authority but one other well there were two other things that I think stood out that I've always believed about Duran is I think he's going to be better as a switch defender guarding on the perimeter than people thought like some people compared him to DeAndre Jordan and look Jordan made all-star games he was a good center But I think there's more to Duran's game, and we saw a little bit of him guarding on the perimeter. To me, he looked good there. And the one other thing, too, are the passing flashes that we saw throughout last season at Memphis. I always believed in those. Now, he's so young. He's obviously not going to be some just Jokic-level passer, nothing close to that yet. But the flashes at that age for a center of his archetype with that athleticism, to me, point to some upside. And there were two flashes yesterday where he got doubled in the post and then threw a nice cross court kick pass into the corner for an open three. And then one in transition where he looked up and threw a hit ahead for a layup. And so those things are things you just don't usually see from a really athletic young center. And that's to me, combined with obviously his ridiculous physical tools, why I saw him as the fifth best prospect. Like I just saw a high floor because of the physical tools and the young age and production, plus those flashes to me is why I think that he could be an all-star as soon as two, three, four years down the road. And he ended up in a great spot where Cade, Ivy, guys like that are going to be throwing him lobs. So I was very impressed. Didn't move him up because I have nowhere else to move him. I already have him as a top five guy in this class one of my favorite prospects and really enjoyed seeing him last night in person. Yeah. And I, I moved him up to number six on my final board and he was always in the top 10. Um, I think yeah. the lowest he got was nine. Um, and and it, what sold me is just the fact that every time I watched him, he made plays that made me be like, wow, like how is he doing that this early? And then I yeah. thought, you know what, like you can't teach athleticism. You can't teach the age like the the way he's able to physically dominate a game at this age so i'm with you there uh correct me if i'm wrong you had five of your top six players playing in in those last the two games last night right yeah and then chet the other one who yeah yeah, so you've seen you've seen all six chet was number one Uh, we'll get to chet in the next segment but let let me let me ask uh, add something real quick on duran and then i'm going to ask something about ivy and sharp i thought jalen duran's biggest impact is is that on that initial set where they threw the alley-oop ivy to duran which was yeah. beautiful he was in the corner and i was wondering i was like yeah. man are they going to have him shoot the three and then yeah. obviously slides baseline he catches this ball well above the rim uh, i think 
the, what, what's so valuable here is that the Pistons are basically playing their core of the future. Uh, Cade didn't play, Sadiq Bay didn't play, but Isaiah Stewart's learning how to play the four on offense and shooting threes. And I think Duran's learning how to play with the people that'll be the like the beneficiaries for him. Like he's they're gonna throw lobs to him, and so he's gonna learn so fast. And I and I said in a podcast we did together right before the draft, I said uh, my bold take was that Duran will be an All Star in five years. And so we're, we're on the same page there. Uh, Jaden Ivy, he showed the speed. He got downhill a couple times. He had some turnovers. He played a little rushed. What was your overall assessment on him? And then also, uh, if you will, touch on Shaden Sharp, even though his appearance was brief. Okay, so Sharp first is the jumper looks really nice to me in person. He was doing windmill alley oops, so you could see the physical tools in the shot before the game. You know, I had him six. That's uh, did he go six or seven on draft night? He, he went, went seventh. Seventh. Okay, to the Blazers. Yeah. So, so I was very excited to see him. He was probably the guy I wanted to see most because we just hadn't seen him in so long. And so he started with two jumpers. And first of all, I'll add this is you can tell some of the guys, especially the rookies that haven't played before, are just nervous out there. It's their first NBA game, first time putting on an NBA jersey in front of a lot of people. Like, I cannot blame them at all. I would be so nervous. Jabari Smith, to me, looked pretty tight and pretty nervous. A lot of other guys. I thought Sharp did on those first two jumpers. They kind of came out flat and hit front iron. But then you saw the promise with the like baseline kind of, he kind of spun and fade away and hit like the baseline fade away jumper. And I turned to my brother and I was like, that looked like Paul George to me. And that's kind of like the comp. I think if he's going to hit a high end ceiling, he's a little shorter than Paul George at like six, six, but the smoothness, the beautiful jumper and the ball skills, plus the athleticism, that's kind of the guy that he reminds me of. Now, he's got a long way to go to hit a Paul George-like outcome, obviously. Um, but then I tweeted out because I saw the injury happen. I saw him leave the court. He like fell and there was like a loose ball and kind of tweaked something in his left arm. And I saw he's gonna get an MRI. So let's hope he can play again. Hope it wasn't just a, a four or five minute summer league stint for him, but we'll end up seeing with that. And so very short, pretty much what we expected from him. Not much to glean from that. Um, as for Jaden Ivey, I'll, I'll lead it off by saying, you know, I talked about how the first game was super physical. The second game was chocked full of elite athletes up and down the board, especially for um, the Blazers. Not as much skill level, but a ton of athleticism between Greg Brown Keon Johnson, Jabari Walker, and then the Pistons, obviously, Duran, Ivy, Sabin Lee, a ton of freak athletes out there. Not as much skill level, and that led to a ton of fouls. There were like 65 fouls. It was painful <laughs> at times to sit through the game. So guys were getting into Ivy, fouling him every time he drove. But still, especially as the game wore on in the second half, you saw him a little more in the full court. You saw the speed, the athleticism. Uh, one or two of his classic dunks where he kind of grips the ball with one arm and, and flies in for his dunks. The speed stood out. The jumper is a little of a question mark. I know he made two or three, uh, but it was weird because when it didn't go in, it was way off. And so I'll be interested to see how the jumper looks as we get more of a sample with him at the NBA line. But the athleticism stood out. He ended up putting tw uh, putting up 20 points, six assists, six rebounds after what seemed like a slow start for him. And of course, he was being guarded by a ton of good athletes and good defenders on the other end. So all in all, like a good start for Ivy, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I noticed that especially Colby Ross really got in his body and made things tough for Ivy. Uh, I, I thought that his issues more pertain to playing point guard because he was trying to juggle being the point guard and scoring, which I know he did at Purdue, but it's a different ball game with the with similar level athletes. And obviously he's an upper echelon of the upper echelon, but but there's there is an adjustment. Um he had a couple befuddling turnovers that I was like, oh man, you can't be doing that. But then you see those bursts, you just can't teach it. So I'm always a believer in that. I ended up with Jaden Ivey at number three on my board. And I, I got some slack for that, having Jabari slip. Um, and, and 
I'm, I'm curious to see how that plays out and I'm sure we will all be curious and coming up next, we'll talk about uh, the impression and the impression that it was the impressive one from Chet Holmgren. And we'll talk about Jalen Williams from WCC products who really impressed in the Salt Lake summer league. But first let me tell you about bet online BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs and MLB base, Major League Baseball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this offseason. BetOnline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. Welcome back once again. It's Leaf Tulin with Sam Ferris, aka the Intelligent One, and and he's given some intelligent takes. And and there's no matter how intelligent you are, you're gonna have people you're gonna you're gonna look back and watch, and you're gonna say, oh, you know, I could have done this differently. I'm sure I'm gonna have a few. So far, I've I've felt good in my evaluations. It sounds like Sam has as well. We we both have been happy with our summer league. Um, Chet Holmgren was your number one player, right? He was, yeah. So Chet, um, he was my number two player, and and he he really looked incredible in the first game. Twenty three points, seven rebounds, on incredible efficiency. Set a Salt Lake Summer League record and of uh, six blocks. I was sad I couldn't be there. Um, Chet dominated from inside and out, and and I think that's no surprise playing at this level. Then people are going to be like, oh man, he got bullied by Kenny Lofton Jr. the next game. I, I don't see it that way. He f- made Kenny Lofton foul basically into a point where he wouldn't have been relevant. He was awesome. And then Jalen Williams was really, really impressive, but he just didn't catch the, the headlines because Josh Giddy and Chet were just unbelievable. Uh, being at that first game for Chet Holmgren, what impressed you uh, aside from just the overall production? So everything <laughs> impressed me because, you know, uh, I saw a couple of people debating how impressive his summer league debut was. I've been going to both the Salt Lake. I've gone to a lot of Salt Lake summer leagues and I've gone to Vegas for like the past, I think since 2016 and every year. And that was up there with some of the best summer league debuts ever, if not the best one that I've ever seen, probably. Just because the shot making combined with his overall impact that Chet always has, which is the, the rim protection, blocking shots, but not just blocking shots, also deterring a ton of shots combined with the shot making was just a ridiculous total impact on the game where he dominated it. And even in the second game where he didn't shoot well, he looked tired at times. He was kind of like doubled over, uh, like gasping for wind at times. Uh, Still through the two games, I noted that he was plus 46 and then OKC was negative. Uh, with him out of the game over the three games. And that just goes to show what I always talked about and why I had Chet number one is if if you don't believe anyone in this class is going to be a great number one player on a deep playoff team, then I believe Chet is going to be an ideal number two player because his total impact is felt in every way, whether it's off the ball offensively, his rim protection and deterrence defensively. And that's why I think he has a high floor as a prospect. But the exciting thing is we also saw the flashes of why his ceiling is so high, uh, whether it was dribbling into pull up threes or dribbling into a Dirk fadeaway jumper. Like those things were really, really exciting and those won't go in every night but his night to night impact will always be felt. And so that's why I had him as my number one prospect. And that's why it was so fun to see him in person is you can just see his demeanor out there. I've seen him a few times. I got to see him when he came and played at BYU, a game where he just completely dominated one of the best prospect performances of the season. And that's what we saw from him in the Utah Summer League. And so whether or not he'll end up shooting like 50% from three, obviously those shots aren't going to continue to go in at that rate, but the night to night impact will always be felt with him. And that's why I think OKC might be a little bit better than people think this year because they had like a top 15 defense for most of the year last year. 
add Chet into that mix, I wouldn't be surprised if they have a top 12 defense this year. And that's pretty exciting for a team that young. Uh, but what was it that stood out to you watching Chet from, from afar, having him number two on your board? Yeah, I, I wasn't surprised by anything that Chet did individually, but it was just the accumulation of of the way he shot so confidently. He, ca- he, yeah. ca- he caught a trail three, splashed it, dribbled into a three, splashed it, hit the dirt fadeaway, and it was all in successive possessions, or it felt like it. They were all within a few possessions. And then defensively, you get the ball down low, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, man, this is the test. This is the test. Can he body up? And he pins the ball against the backboard for Kofi Coburn and Taco Fall, like two guys that won't actually play in the NBA. Um, And uh, what impressed me from afar is just I've watched so much Gonzaga and nothing shocked me. But what impressed me is the just the immediacy of the translation, how smooth his shot looked from uh, from NBA range. Uh, I predicted Chet uh, would would be a guy that early and throughout his career would would be a great second option offensively and defensively would be an all NBA guy. I just thought that Jabari would be the the most, I'm sorry. uh, I meant Paolo. Paolo. Um, That would be, that'd be a really weird change to switch up now. (laughs) Um, uh, Paolo would be the the guy who had the most potential to be the franchise altering scorer. And and I still kind of believe that, especially after watching what I saw yesterday Um, and time will tell, but, Chet and, and Paolo were a hair thin uh, for me in terms of the difference between the two. Um, but Chet, what, what he does is that I know defensively he's going to impact the game, despite, you know, people are going to point out the loft and uh, burying him under the rim and scoring too early in the second game. But he changed the game unbelievably. Um, and then offensively, if he can shoot 40% from three, which I don't think is crazy because his touch is awesome. Mm-hmm. He's. I was stunned. He only shot seventy one percent for at Gonzaga. I think there's a chance that he shoots forty percent from three. He scores seventeen points a game early in his career and gets that up to twenty perhaps and plays kind of like a Jaron Jackson Jr. role on offense mm-hmm. and defense. I think he's better than Jaron Jackson Jr., who is an All NBA guy. Um, it, it's pretty hard to really pick a bone with. And so I, I was all all in on the Chet performance. And time will tell between Paolo and Chet. And I, I think those are the two best players in the class. Yeah, I want to hit, because you made some really good points, a few that I've made in the past. I should have mentioned this earlier, but his willingness to take threes in those games that we watched was, like you said, one of the more important factors, because over a short sample, you want to look more at volume than how many actually go in. And that was kind of one of the questions with him is, there were two main questions with Chet offensively, is how much volume would he get up from three? Because oftentimes he doesn't want to take that many and his shot was a little bit slow and so that was good to see and then also how like effective his handle would be in the half court that's still to be determined but it it looked solid enough to this point and you made the jaron jackson comparison that's one i've made in the past so i like that because people say more like the porzingis but i think he's closer to jaron jackson and and I think he's going to be better than Jaron Jackson. Like you said, he's a better defensive player. And I think he's got a higher ceiling offensively too. And um, there's a stat I looked up where over the last 20 years, only two college players have averaged uh, like 10 points, f- like four rebounds, one block and one three point make. So not even like that high of thresholds. So there's been very few guys that, could block shots and make threes at the rate in college basketball that Jaron Jackson and Chet Holmgren have done. So I always liked that comparison better. So I really like those points you made there. And then the last guy we wanted to get into was Jalen Williams. And seeing him in person, he really stood out physically. And the reason why is because his arms are so long. And we saw the measurements at the combine Um, One OKC Thunder fan posted on Twitter that Draymond Green and Jalen Williams have the same same standing reach because of those freakishly long arms. And man, it just stood out in person, like his arms just go forever. And then apart from that, his actual game really stood out because he shot 100% from three, which isn't going to happen or carry on forever. But what I really liked about him, because we mostly saw him on ball at Santa Clara, I thought he was awesome as a cutter, playing on the wings, playing baseline, cutting in for layups and dunks, playing off of Chet and Giddy. And that's really important to him because 
in OKC, it's going to be like Giddy's going to have the ball a ton. SGA is going to have the ball a ton. Chet a little bit. And then like Trey Mann a little bit. So his ability to play off of those guys, play on the baseline as a cutter and finisher is going to be really important. And then the spot up three. And I think he's going to do all those things really well. So if I had to pick one guy, and I think he's really the only guy that I would move up pretty substantially from where I had him in the mid 20s, or I think I had him like 20 through 25 on my board coming in, I would move him up. And I think that was a good pick, honestly, by OKC picking him in the lottery. So yeah, he's probably the one guy that I've really actually changed my opinion on watching the game so far. Yeah, I'm with you there. I I watched him and and the thing that impressed me is you talked about his physicality and the impressive wingspan. He guarded Jared Butler, who, who I think should have excelled. And he, he made him a pretty much non-factor in the first game. Um, and, and that was concerning as a jazz fan, but um, Jalen Williams really impressed me. And I think you throw him into the equation, like you talked about with Chet with a top 15 already existing defense. And, and they really excel defensively, especially with Lou Dort coming back yeah. after being injured for much of the season. I'm very, uh, eager to see that. I, I had him at 22 on my final board. I toyed with him anywhere between 25 and 18. So I think we're we're pretty similar there. I, I agree. I think he far outperformed Usman Jang, but that didn't shock me necessarily that he outperformed Usman Jang because Jang's so young. He's like he's like a colt on the basketball court. Um, he, he moves very gingerly. He's kind of so finesse reliant. I was not shocked Jang struggled but I was very impressed by Jalen Williams. And I would, if I were to do a redraft or like a re big board, I'd, I'd move him up a couple spots and maybe even more than a couple. Um, well, that'll do it for us, Sam. Thank you for your time and enjoy summer league today. And, and we'll, we'll, I'm sure connect again and talk, talk some drafts soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. And that's been locked on NBA big board with Lee Tulane and Sam Ferris. Hope you tune in for the next show with Raphael Barlow. And I'm sure he'll have some great insight uh, for, uh, from the Summer League as it go, goes through. And he, he'll be at the Vegas Summer League all throughout it. That'll do it. Have a good one.